Hey guys, what is up? How are y'all doing today? I hope that you are doing absolutely amazing. My name is Nicole Andrusco and I welcome you back to my YouTube channel. Now, today I'm super excited because I am finally filming another video that kind of goes under that true crime category. But instead of talking about murderers and specific true crime cases like I did in the last video um, on true crime where I talked about the Lizzie Borden case. By the way, if you've not yet checked that video out, I will go ahead and link it down in the description below. I highly suggest you check it out if you're into everything true crime, especially when it comes to the Victorian era. But today, Specifically, I'm going to talk about the hauntings of the Crescent Hotel. Now, if some of you have not heard of what the Crescent Hotel is, it's actually a luxury hotel in Eureka Springs, Arkansas, and it was built in 1886. So it's been around for a very long time. And now I actually remember going there when I was a kid, when my parents and I went on vacation in Branson, Missouri, we actually stopped by Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And we didn't have like a formal ghost tour or anything like that, but I could have sworn when we were in front of the hotel, I saw the blurred image of a man's figure kind of pacing back and forth in front of the front one of the front main windows. And then when I asked somebody who worked at the hotel about this ghost, he said that that particular room where the window was had been closed off for a long time and nobody was there. And oddly enough, when I went and looked on the um, Crescent Hotel website shortly before my husband and I went a few weeks ago, I saw some of the images that the hotel staff had captured of some of these ghosts. And one of those images, which I'll insert here, is of the same exact ghost I saw when I was a kid. So that was really freaky. And that's just kind of to provide you a little bit of a personal background with my experience with the hotel. Now, as I mentioned a few weeks ago, when my husband and I decided to tour Branson, Missouri, we did stop at the Eureka Springs Crescent Hotel and we actually paid for a ghost tour. So what I'm going to do with this video is I'm going to cover the history of the Crescent Hotel, um, some of the most famous hauntings of the hotel, as well as some specific footage that my husband and I were able to get of some of the really creepy things that we captured at the hotel. So if this is something you're interested in learning about, please keep on watching. So I think it's only appropriate, before we delve into the history of the Crescent Hotel, we need to talk about the history of Eureka Springs, the town, because that is where the hotel was built and where it still stands today. Now, way back in the day, Eureka Springs was known to have at least 60 streams of mineral water. And this mineral water was rumored to have some sort of healing powers. And so thousands upon thousands of people would flock to these healing powered streams to cure themselves from their sicknesses, their diseases, and perhaps even to extend their lifespan and maybe stay young for a little longer. Now, obviously we don't have any hardcore evident proof that these healing waters actually healed people, but rumors were spreading pretty quickly that these waters did have a positive effect on people who were dealing with some serious illnesses. Now, one of those thousands of people that would frequently visit this location in Arkansas was none other than a man named Clayton Powell. Now, who's Clayton Powell, you might ask? Well, he was a pretty influential, important person. Um, he was actually a prior Arkansas governor, and now he was one of the U.S. state senators. And one time when he went to visit these healing waters, a little light bulb went off in his head and he thought, hmm, well, thousands upon thousands of people flock here every single year, and there's really nothing else here for them. There's no places for them to really stay. There's really no shops. Eureka Springs at the time was kind of just your average 
run-of-the-mill town in the middle of nowhere. I don't even know if you could fully consider it to be a town um, back in those days and those standards. So he thought to himself, we should really build up Eureka Springs and make it a town of extravagance and luxury and entertainment so we can make a profit off these thousands of people that come here every year to go to the healing waters and let the waters do its magic. Now, Clayton Powell at the time was also starting to get involved with the railroad industry and not just with commercial trains, which you know, commercial trains transport goods from one place to the other, but he also wanted to get involved with recreational trains, meaning instead of transporting goods, people would travel on the train from one destination to the next. Just like nowadays we have the Metro and we have you know, if you're in a bigger city, you have the subway. Now, he thought, what better way to incentivize these people and persuade them to travel on these trains and to create a nice, luxurious hotel? So, in other words, a cool place for them to stay. And so, with the help of his friend, Richard Kearns, they both ended up establishing the Eureka Springs Railroad, and then they hired their architect friend named Isaac S. Taylor to build this extravagant, luxurious hotel on top of a very tall cliff that overlooks Eureka Springs, Arkansas. And this happened in May of 1886. Now, this wasn't just any standard hotel that you think of when we go and stay the night at a hotel when we're out of town. This was pretty much handcrafted. Um, there were some Irish artisans from Clayton Powell's other company called the Re Eureka Springs Improvement Company. So Clayton Powell, I see you, you making them money, you making them dollars, that profit. Well, anyway, it said that these artisans actually extracted limestones from the nearby river quarry and used those limestones to build this hotel. And this hotel was known to be nothing short of luxurious. On its opening day in May of 1886, there was a huge gala event and there were so many prominent, influential, wealthy people that came to this event, such as high-ranking officials and politicians, and they just danced the night away on the ballroom floor. So as you can see, this hotel was a really big deal back in those days. And before you knew it, it started to gain a lot of success. So Clayton Powell and Richard Kearns, they did a pretty good job at thinking ahead. Now, in 1905, the hotel was then actually sold and bought by the Frisco Railroad Company because of all the success it was gaining. However, unfortunately, during the off months, which was during the winter, people weren't really coming to the hotel as much. It was mainly just during the summer months when they would go to visit Eureka Springs. So, unfortunately, the hotel had to close its doors and was instead turned into a college for girls in 1908. Now, this college for girls was an all-girl boarding school, and it was more formally known as the Crescent College and Conservatory for Young Women. And it is said only the fine young ladies would go there, meaning they were women who came from very wealthy, prominent families. And it's said that this school had very strict rules. I mean, think of any of you who might have gone to a Catholic school, for example, or maybe you hear um, traditionally of Catholic schools being very strict, having a rigid structure, um, being taught by nuns and priests. Well, it was kind of this way at this school. These young ladies were forced to follow very strict rules. They couldn't just leave the property whenever they wanted. Um, now, I feel like probably at least a couple times a week, the ladies were all able to travel together to go to the different shops or go out to eat at a diner and perhaps were supervised by an older adult. But nonetheless, they weren't really allowed much freedom. They couldn't have men for sure come over and spend time with them. And they would have severe consequences if they tried to leave in the middle of the night. Now, unfortunately, this college 
didn't last too long. It lasted until about 1934 when things really started to hit rock bottom due to the Great Depression. And so once again, the Crescent Hotel or the college as it was, closed its doors and then reopened as a part-time hotel during the summer months until the year of 1937 when it was bought by none other than a man named Dr. Norman Baker. And he transformed the hotel into what was known as the Baker's Cancer Curing Hospital. Now, let me just tell you about this Norman Baker. He was a crock of SHIT and he was a complete whack job. And the reason why I did parentheses or quotation marks over doctor is because he really wasn't a doctor. He had absolutely no medical knowledge, experience, or practice. Yet, he was able to convince so many people that he found the cure to cancer. And so, hundreds of people who were desperate and had these very um, lifelong threatening sicknesses, they decided to go to him because they didn't know who else to go to. I mean, this man was a very influential guy. He was known to be a successful inventor and he also had this very large radio broadcast that so many people listened to. And unfortunately, he took advantage of this influence he had over people to try and trick them into believing that he could save their lives. Now, I remember when I first found out about this during our ghost tour, my husband and I were sitting in our car on the way back to our hotel. We were thinking to ourselves, why would anyone fall for that? I mean, this guy clearly had no medical experience. You'd think nowadays, you know, no one would fall for that. But if you think back to these times, this was the 1930s and these people had gone through a lot. They'd already gone through the Great Depression. They'd already gone through a one world war. There was just a lot of stuff going on and sometimes desperate calls call for desperate measures. And these people were just willing to hang on to anyone who claimed that they believed they could cure them. Also back then, we didn't really have as advanced medications and things that we have today. I don't believe that chemotherapy even existed back then for people who had cancer. And so these people were really just trusting their lives in the hands of someone who unfortunately was no more than just a fraud. Now, when these people came to this cancer curing hospital, Norman Baker actually would inject his cancer patients with different elixirs. And these elixirs consisted of alcohol, glycerin, tea brewed from watermelon seed and clover leaves, peppermint, and even carbolic acid. Now, obviously carbolic acid doesn't sound too friendly. Um, those of you who don't know what that is, carbolic acid is known to be a very poisonous chemical substance created from tar, and it is used in some household disinfectants as well as used to make plastic. So obviously that does not sound like a good thing to be ingesting or to be being put into your bodies, but nonetheless, this was part of those elixirs. Now, it's not known for sure whether or not Norman Baker knew that he was poisoning his patients. Again, this was back in the 1930s. Um, medicine and knowledge of medications and things like that weren't really advanced like they are today. But nonetheless, even if he wasn't trying to hurt these patients intentionally, I think it's just as disgusting that he knew he was taking advantage of their desperation just so he can make a profit when he wasn't helping them at all. Now, not only were these injections pretty much lethal and poisonous, but they were also hurting these patients a lot. And these patients had to endure these injections sometimes at least twice a day. And they would complain about how painful they were, especially because they weren't being administered any pain medication. So Norman Baker was literally torturing his patients. Not only did they, did they have to live with a life-threatening disease such as cancer, and they were holding on for dear life due to that, but they also had to deal with these extremely painful, extremely lethal concoctions that were literally being injected into their bodies day in and day out, and they received no treatment for the pain. So you know what not Dr. Norman Baker did when these people would complain? He didn't want to hear it. 
He did not want to deal with it. Instead of placing responsibility on himself for being a complete quack job and not really knowing what the heck he was doing, instead of admitting to that, he decided to tell the patients that it was their fault. They weren't getting enough exercise. They weren't getting enough fresh air. They weren't eating healthy enough. And they weren't really taking care of their mental health. So you know what they did, or what he did? He decided to throw these patients into a room that he called the asylum and isolated them from the rest of the building. And he would close them in, lock them in with these big steel doors. So you couldn't even hear their cries. You couldn't even hear their pain. It was all muffled out. Now, if some of their friends started asking around for them saying, hey, where'd Sue go? I haven't seen Sue or heard from her in a while. Norman Baker would just use a pretty lame excuse and say, oh, Sue is working on her mental health. She's not dealing with the injections the way she's supposed to. So we put her in this asylum room. And obviously this asylum room was where probably hundreds of people died because they're literally sent there just to die. Pretty sick, pretty tragic. And there's such a horrible treatment of these innocent people who literally trusted this man with their entire lives, blindly. Now, something interesting I also wanna talk about and I learned about on my ghost tour. Apparently Norman Baker was also obsessed with the color purple. And so he kind of just went crazy with it and decided to paint all the chimneys in, hotel, in the hotel purple. And as a result, he would force his cancer patients to sleep outside while this was being done on the balconies. People who are dying from cancer, people who are already very sick, weak, and fragile. And his excuse was, oh, the fresh outside air is good for them. Hmm. Nice one, Baker. Now, eventually, things were not looking good for Norm Baker because people were starting to catch on to his crap. And they were starting to realize that he wasn't who he claimed he was, that he wasn't really a real doctor and he might be causing harm to these patients rather than good. And so, out of desperation, Baker had a wonderful, fantastic idea and he decided, okay, I'm gonna take these dead patients, right, who had died, and he didn't want it to be known public that literally so many of his patients were dying because again, he was trying to advertise himself as his cancer cure. He decided to take their dead bodies, place them on a surgical table downstairs, which is now called the morgue, and I do have some footage of it, so I will put it here for you. And he decided to cut up their bodies and take out their organs and place these organs in jars. And he created this kind of collection of them because he thought, hmm, well, if I can show people these organs from human bodies, maybe they'll see that I am doing good work and I am curing cancer. Like, does that make any sense to you? <laughs> Absolutely no sense. Again, this guy is a complete whack job. He literally doesn't know what he's doing and he is so desperate to hide his evil doings. Now, what's interesting enough is these organs actually were placed in the hotel, I believe in the 1960s. Um, don't quote me on that. They're kind of placed on a display shelf um, just so visitors could see these jars of organs. Um, but a lot of people that came to the hotel started to complain because seeing these dead people's organs really made them feel sick and uneasy. And so someone who worked at the hotel decided that they were just going to throw all the organs into the dumpster, get rid of them, um, so that way no one had to see them again. Now that's where these organs were believed to be, in a dumpster somewhere, until just a couple years ago, these jars of organs were actually excavated from the property of the Crescent Hotel. So now they actually are in the hotel in the morgue. And my husband and I, when we went to take some footage of these organs. He freaked out because he could have sworn he was standing next to a heart. It was an organ that was shaped like a heart in one of the jars. Um, so it's pretty interesting to see just how crazy this dude was. 
and all the organs he had collected and the flesh and the ooziness. Ooh, I just can't imagine how mentally unstable and crazy you must be, how psychopathic you must be to be okay with cutting up bodies like that and collecting their organs, especially when you're not a doctor and have no knowledge or experience with any of that. So great, nice job, Norman Baker. Now, fortunately enough in 1940, karma did catch up to him because he was arrested and charged for fraud and thrown into the Leavenworth Federal Prison. After he was thrown into prison, obviously the hospital was shut down. And to be kind of a little bit of a disappointment, there was really no record of who came to his hospital, of who were his cancer patients, because it's rumored that he probably destroyed the evidence or any records he had of who came to him for help. Now think about it, this is back in the 1930s, right? They didn't have computers, they didn't have any databases or systems that where they logged patients' information in. It was probably just all on paper, which is unfortunately easy to destroy. So it's kind of hard to know exactly who came to him and who died due to his lack of knowledge and due to his cruelty, but we know that more, most likely hundreds of people died due to Norman Baker. Now, once the hospital was closed, the Crescent Hotel came into ownership of several different people over the next several decades, and it reopened as a hotel and was the host of lots of weddings and honeymoons and vacations. And then the Crescent Hotel was bought in 1997 by Marty and Elise Roignick. I hope I'm not mispronouncing their last name. And they decided, decided to renovate the hotel, but to bring it back to its former glory and try the best they could to reestablish it in its older 1886 form. And what's actually really cool is that Marty and Lise decided to advertise this hotel as the most haunted hotel in America because of all the hauntings that have taken place and stories that so many people over the years have told and all the gruesome history that happened in this hotel. Now, normally before, <laughs> um, people would kind of try to hide the fact or previous owners would kind of try to hide the fact that the hotel was haunted because they were worried that if they told the truth that not as many people would be attracted to the hotel. But Marty and Elise made an awesome business venture, made an awesome business move, and they decided to advertise it just as it is. One of the most haunted hotels in America. And now lots of people flock there every single day. And it's really, what's really cool is I found on YouTube, there's actually some YouTubers who have done ghost tours at night and have some pretty spooky, scary stories to share. So that is the history of the Crescent Hotel. Now let's move into the part that I know you are all dying to hear about. <laughs> Get it? Dying. And that is the hauntings of the Crescent Hotel. So with the hauntings of the Crescent Hotel, I'm not going to go into detail about every single haunting there is because we would be here all day, but I am going to talk about a few of the most popular hauntings that people have seen or experienced for themselves at the Crescent Hotel. Now the first haunting that I heard of on the ghost tour was actually by a little girl who was said to be the daughter of perhaps one of the nurses who was on Norman Baker's staff during the time at the Crescent Hotel was this cancer curing hospital. Come with me, okay? Come on, let's see if she'll go downstairs. Come on. Now, nobody knows what the name of this little girl is, but we do know that she did die. Unfortunately, she was left unattended at the top of the stairs. And you know with little kids, you have to be very cautious. You have to watch out for them because the second you turn away, something tragic could happen. And unfortunately, tragedy did hit because this poor little girl fell five floors to her death. Now, obviously we don't know the name of this little girl, but some people know of her physical appearance and she's said to have blonde hair and how we know this is because there have been people who have actually woken up in bed 
at this hotel to this little girl standing at the edge of their bed staring at them. And now my tour guide actually said that she had experienced the touch of this little girl, that there was a certain flight of stairs she would go down. And sometimes as she was walking down, she would feel a tiny little finger touch her hand as though the little girl's ghost was trying to hold hands with her. Or sometimes that the little girl would try and pull at your shirt or at your pants as you're walking. And what's really crazy about this is I was kind of in back of everyone as we were walking down this set of stairs to start the ghost tour. And I was wearing kind of a loose blouse, but I could have sworn that I felt like my shirt in the back was kind of being lifted up like this, as though someone were tugging at it. Now, I guess people could argue and I don't know, maybe it was a gust of wind, but it was really hot and stuffy in that hotel and it was a hot and stuffy day outside and nobody was behind me, nobody was next to me. I was in the very back of the line. So it could be a little girl or it could be a much more logical explanation, but nonetheless, that did give me the heebie-jeebies and I don't know, let me know in the comments down below. Do you think that was just my imagination? Or do you think that was actually the little girl reaching out and tugging at my shirt? Now, kind of moving along with the ghosts of little children, there's also another ghost on the second floor. And the second floor in the hotel is known to be the most active floor. And this little boy was known as Brecky. Now, Brecky was the son of the president of the Crescent College when it was a college for young girls. And him and his wife stayed there and they had this little boy who was very outgoing, very lively, and kind of a little sassy, which I'll go into in a little bit. But unfortunately, when he was only four years old, Brecky ended up passing away due to appendicitis. Now people have heard on the second floor in the middle of the night, they've heard a ball bouncing on the floor and against the wall. And sometimes when they go out and investigate, they'll hear a little boy's voice saying, life isn't fair or this isn't fair. Now it is said perhaps that maybe this is Brecky and he's saying, well, this isn't fair because he loved to be outdoors and be playing. However, he was kind of stuck and confined inside this building all day because this is where they lived and where his father worked. But people really think that this is the little boy, Brecky. So are you getting spooked out yet? <laughs> well, I'm gonna continue on with some more hauntings. Now the third haunting I wanna talk about is of a young woman that is said to have died when this Crescent Hotel was the college for young ladies. Now, it's said that she either jumped or she fell over a balcony outside to her death. However, people have seen her kind of in the middle of the night, around 10.30 at night outside the hotel. People have seen her ghost fall, but they've also seen the figure of a man behind her. Now again, this is one of those ghosts, just like the little girl, where we don't really know this woman's name because a lot of these young women who went to this college um, were pretty hidden and pretty protected. So I'm not really sure if their families really wanted to publicize their names or where they were at. Again, these ladies came, these students came from very wealthy, prominent, powerful families. But it is rumored that this girl was pregnant. Oh! In the 1930s, man, if a woman was pregnant out of wedlock, especially if she came from a very successful, prominent family, they were doomed and they would bring lots of shame to their family. And it was something that people would look down on women for. And so it is said perhaps that maybe it was her own father who pushed her over the balcony to her death because he was so scared of the family name being tarnished. So. Obviously, we don't have any evidence. She could have just fallen. Maybe she had gotten drunk and fallen, or maybe she jumped to her doom because she was so scared of the repercussions of what happened. Nonetheless, an innocent young woman died just because she was pregnant, just because she was going to give life to a beautiful baby boy or girl. 
Now the next one I want to talk about is a ghost by the name of Theodora. Now it is said perhaps that Theodora was a cancer patient as well as a nurse on Norman Baker staff, again, when the hotel was the cancer curing hospital. And she kind of haunts the room for 19. Obviously she passed away due to cancer. And people who have stayed in that room say that she's actually a very friendly ghost, that a lot of times she'll even organize things for them, that she'll kind of unpack their suitcases for them when they're not there and place them in the dresser drawers. Um, also, people have talked about waking up and trying to find their slippers and they realize that she placed their slippers right next to their bed when they know for sure that's not where they put their slippers. However, if people were staying the night there and being naughty or doing something weird, or if there was a couple there that's arguing, which is one specific story I want to talk about, there was a couple that was staying in the room 419 and they were arguing, really not having a good time, and this really upset Theodora. It was not very pleasant for her, and so it said that they left the room and that when they came back, all their things were in their suitcases and their suitcases were waiting for them right by the door. It's like Theodora was saying, mm -mm, you're not gonna be good on this trip. You're not gonna be nice to each other. I want you to leave, bye-bye. So that's one of the more friendly ghosts that people have experienced. Now the last ghost I wanna talk about, his name is Michael. And he is said to be one of the oldest ghosts there at the hotel. Now, Michael was actually a part of the construction of the hotel, dating all the way back to the years between 1884 and 1886. And he was only 17 years old at the time. Now, it said that Michael was, he was pretty girl crazy. So one day when he was on the top of the building doing his construction work, he spotted a beautiful young lady walking outside the hotel and he was so desperate to get her attention. He was like, hey girl, how you doing? And he was trying to gain her attention and as soon as he did this, he lost his footing and fell to his death to a beam that went through room 218, which is a room that is the most haunted. Now, gosh, I'm not laughing about his death Obviously, was very young, too young to die, but man, talk about ways to go. That is a really horrible way to go. Pretty lame, if you ask me. So it is said now that room 218 is the most requested room, and a lot of women actually like staying there because they hear that Michael's still girl crazy. Um, there have been women who have talked about staying in the hotel when they go to take a shower. He'll like play with the shower curtains. He'll like open them and he'll also play with the knobs and change the temperature of the water, which you're a bad boy. You're a very bad boy, Michael. <laughs> you should not be doing that. He's kind of a pervert. And there have also been stories of women who have gone to bed at night and they feel as though someone is next to them even though they're there alone. And there have also been couples that stay there and the men have complained about either being yanked from their bed in the middle of the night or getting their covers taken off of them because Michael wants the ladies all to himself. Now, those are the hauntings that I've heard of that I've never personally experienced, but I'm going to talk a little bit about a photo that I captured during our ghost tour when my husband and I were there. So at one point in our ghost tour, in one of the hallways, our ghost tour was talking, our ghost guide was talking about how there were four different child ghosts that people would sometimes hear of in the middle of the night. And they don't know where these children came from. They don't know their stories. I presume that they probably came from Norman's uh, Norman Baker's Cancer Curing Hospital because again, we don't have any real records of who came there and who's to say it wasn't just adults that were there but also children because unfortunately children do get cancer as well. And she said that people hear of these four ghosts and that they see these little orbs and they're different colors like blue and purple. And that sometimes these little child ghosts, like they really just try to congregate together and protect each other. And some people have heard of these ghosts saying that they're, they're trying to run away from an evil presence, from an evil spirit. Now, what's crazy is that 
Soon after my tour guide talked about this, I caught a picture of what looks like little orbs, and I'll insert it here. And if you can look really closely, there's four of them. Just like she said, there were four child ghosts. Now, I guess this could be easily explained. Maybe this was just due to the lights reflecting. Um, could have been these little orbs could have just been bouncing off the lights reflection. But I have an iPhone, and so this was a live photo. And so when I press down on it, these orbs are going like crazy. Like they're bouncing off the walls or coming together. They're getting really close together. So I don't know for sure if these were the actual ghosts of these dead children that our tour guide talked about, but I feel like it's a pretty real possibility. And it's a pretty freaky coincidence if I do say so myself. Well, that is it for the history and the hauntings of the Crescent Hotel. I hope that you guys enjoyed this video. And if you want to see more similar content like this from me in the future, please feel free to comment down below, like this video and subscribe. It would help me out a lot. And I hope you guys have a great rest of your day, a great week, and please make good choices. And I will see you all in my next video. Bye.